Good afternoon. My name is Juliane Campfield. I'm the director of Deutsches Haus at NYU. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our panel discussion, Germany and Europe after Angela Merkel. We're delighted to co-present this event in collaboration with NYU's Center for European and Mediterranean Studies. I wanna um, say a big thanks to Thomas Zippel and Stephen Gross from SEMS for the wonderful continued cooperation. And of course, for uh, them chairing the discussion, which will uh, feature Joyce Massey ben um, Christian Martin and Robert Borschneider. We are, uh, as always, thankful to our speakers and to the DAD for um, supporting our academically inclined events. Thank you, DAD. Thank you, Ben Blisch, Michael Tomanek. Thank you to my colleagues at Deutsches Haus, to Zara, Christian, Sasha, and Ali, and of course also to the colleagues at SEMS, to Mikala and Anastasia. And thank you to you, the audience, for being here today for the last event that Deutsches Haus at NYU will present during the fall semester. We are delighted to uh, make the time to join us for our events, and we hope you will do so in the uh, spring semester. Also, please remember, you can always learn German Deutsches Haus at NYU. And of course, the topic uh, we were going we are going to discuss is very timely with the current Merkel uh, uh, government having, I think, its last day and the new one uh, under Olaf Scholz starting tomorrow. And um, it will be exciting to do a little Bestandsaufnahme of the last 16 years with the wonderful experts we are here we have here today and to look forward to see what the new Ampel cabinet will do. Uh, a little bit about the Ablauf. I will hand things over to uh, Thomas Zittel now, who will introduce the event and introduce the speakers. Then our three speakers will give uh, uh, presentations and uh, that there will be, the order will be Joyce, Robert and Christian. Then they will have a discussion among one another and then we will open the conversation to you, the audience. Uh, if you would like to submit your questions in writing, please via the Zoom Q&A button, that would be great. Uh, you can do that uh, after the end of the discussion, or you could already start submitting questions or comments whenever you think of them. That's it for me right now. Welcome to our event. And, and now, Thomas, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for the welcoming remarks and uh, for hosting this event. Um, this webinar focuses on the chancellorship of Angela Merkel. We will discuss her legacy and also, in a more general sense, continuities and discontinuities in future German and European politics. As um, Juliana already uh, suggested, uh, the timing of this event could not be more perfect. This is Chancellor Merkel's very last day in office. Tomorrow, the newly formed Bundestag majority of the SPD, Greens, and FDP will elect Olaf Scholz as the ninth German chancellor. However, they are also independent of this perfect timing. There are also a number of good reasons to look back on the Merkel years. Angela Merkel had ample times to leave a special mark in German politics. Together with Helmut Kohl, she's the longest serving chancellor in modern German history, trailed by Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor with his 14 years in office. Kohl and Merkel were 16 years in office. Uh, Angela Merkel also faced a number of major challenges and crises, and uh, it is not an exaggeration to argue that they are far from being resolved. So this renders it particularly relevant to explore her record uh, that continue to affect us. And thirdly, Chancellor Merkel leaves office after two subsequent electoral Armageddons for her party. In 2017, the CDU lost 8.6%, falling from about 41% to 33% of the electoral vote. 
And in 2021, it lost another 8.8%, going down to 24%. So this raises questions about the role of Angela Merkel and whether her party suffers because of her or for other reasons that are independent of Angela Merkel. We are very fortunate to have three distinguished panelists to take up these issues and offer their thoughts on these questions. Each one will provide opening statements of about 10 minutes that are followed by a panel discussion and we will leave enough time for audience questions. So as Juliana already said, please type your questions in the chat function and we will read them out to the panelists. So before we start, let me briefly introduce the panelists in the order of the alphabet. We have Christian Martin on the panel, who is Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Kiel, and he is my successor as Max Weber Chair at NYU. Uh, Christian's interests uh, focus on the field of political economy, with special emphasis on globalization, and he's particularly interested in the question how globalization affects national level party politics and electoral behavior and also policy making. Um, he has particularly worked on the programmatic trajectories of the CDU and how it affected um, the rise of right-wing populism in Germany. So that's a particularly interesting topic for, for this panel. The second panelist is Joyce Moshaven. Uh, she is Curator's Distinguished Professor of Comparative Politics and Brackets Emerita at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And she is an affiliated faculty member of Georgetown's BMW Center for German and European Studies. Joyce has widely published on issues in German politics. It's not an underestimation to say that she's an eminent expert on uh, German politics, one of the experts in this country. She has particularly worked on German unification and identities and also gender politics. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have her on the panel because she's also also an internationally acknowledged expert on Angela Merkel. Um, her book, Becoming Madam Chancellor, was published by, with Cambridge University Press in 2017. So welcome, Joyce. It's a joy that you are here. Our third panelist is Robert Rorschneider. Robert is Sir Robert Wooster, Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Robert is an internationally acknowledged expert on the comparative analysis of political parties and democratic representation. His uh, book, The Strain of Representation, How Parties Represent Diverse Voters in Eastern and Western Europe, published in 2012 with Oxford University Press, is a widely read and cited piece on party strategies amidst changing social and electoral uh, context. But despite his credentials in comparative politics, Robert has also published widely on German political culture and party politics after unification. So it's also a perfect uh, match to our other two panelists on um, the issue of Angela Merkel. The panel will be chaired by uh, Stephen Cross, uh, who is Professor of History at NYU and Director of the Center of European and Mediterranean Studies at NYU, and myself. I'm Thomas Zittel, Professor of Comparative Politics at Goethe University Frankfurt and currently Max Weber Chair for German and European Studies at NYU. So without further ado, I again thank all panelists for participating. I'm very much looking forward to your um, presentations and I hand over the floor to you. Um, Joyce goes first, uh, then followed by Robert and then by Christian. So Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and uh, for the invitation to participate. I miss all of you and I look forward to having a real live panel in a real live city at some future date. Angela Merkel is a person of many firsts. She was clearly the first woman, the first Easterner, the first physicist, and even the first pastor's daughter to serve as the federal chancellor. She was the youngest person to rise to the chancellorship, and not only would she have almost qualified as Germany's longest serving ruler, but I did the math, 
Had she stayed in office until December 17th, she would have been the longest serving ruler among all the post-war European democracies. Perhaps even more significant than her record-breaking designation as Forbes' most powerful woman, 14 out of the last 15 years, is the fact that Merkel is really the only German to have ever been deemed the world's most powerful anything without evoking global fears of another major war. What does it take to qualify as the world's most powerful woman, globally respected as a female leader? Angela Merkel has demonstrated an extraordinary capacity for remaining calm, pragmatic, and rational during an unprecedented wave of global crises. Managing many of these events required her to master highly complex bodies of knowledge, often virtually overnight, starting with the near meltdown of the world's financial markets in 2009. One forgets that a number of these potentially catastrophic developments overlapped in time, albeit not in place. They stretched from Europe to Georgia, to Fukushima, then to Crimea and Ukraine, across the Mediterranean until COVID of course overtook us all. Dating back to her first international environmental summit in 1995 as a minister, Merkel repeatedly learned how to push herself and her national counterparts to soldier through countless all night negotiating sessions in search of compromise. She rescued the EU from its failed constitutional campaign by way of the Lisbon Treaty. This was followed shortly thereafter by the imposition of some tough supranational structural reforms in an effort to save the Euro. As US President Barack Obama recognized during periods of high tension in the Caucasus and Crimea, she was the only person capable of keeping an increasingly authoritarian Vladimir Putin engaged in regional dialogues. Merkel has proven that women have what it takes to literally hold the fort at many levels, even in the face of some pretty insulting treatment by other arrogant, irascible men like Donald Trump, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Viktor Orban, and more recently Xi Jinping. In doing so, she has secured Germany a leading role, not only on the regional stage, but also on the international stage. She has cleared a path, I would argue, for other women to assume powerfully po powerful posts historically denied them, for example, as party chairs, as defense ministers, and even as an EU commission president. Now, critics I know insist that Chancellor Merkel could have and should have done a lot more to expedite the energy turnaround, to advance gender parity in corporate boardrooms, to counter right-wing extremism embodied by the AFD, for example. But I argue that most critics spend very little time reflecting on the complex constraints facing the nation's chief executive in Germany. All of these were codified in the 1949 Basic Law in order to prevent any chancellor from becoming too powerful. Merkel's Richtlinien competence, her guideline competency, allowed her to set fundamental policy parameters, but all of these required the proactive support of her coalition partners. Her proactive use of power was moreover constrained by four different coalition agreements. Three of her four governments included the former opposition, the SPD, not the CDU's longstanding neoliberal junior partner, the FDP. And most of us remember what that one FDP, CSU, CDU coalition was, a disaster. The Resort Prinzip, departmentalization, moreover guarantees German federal ministers in her cabinet significantly more discretion than one finds among cabinet members in presidential systems like the United States. The chancellor has the ability to name and to dismiss individual ministers, but this too usually occurs within the confines of an informal quota system covering various regions of the country, wings of the parties, et cetera. Some of this explains the longevity of the curmudgeonly Horst Seehofer of the CSU, despite major differences between Merkel and her more recent interior minister. 
Thereafter, these ministers at the federal level are free to carry out their duties more or less autonomously within the broad guidelines she set. Most laws must then be approved by a synchronously elected state governments marked by ever more diverse and rapidly changing coalitions at that level. Merkel's enthusiasm for reform admittedly waned after 2017. And I can only partly attribute this to coalition dynamics or the COVID pandemic. But I don't think that justifies a major devaluation or dismissal of her many substantive policy achievements to date. She has transformed and modernized Germany as a nation, as well as the Christian Democratic Party for the better. As an outsider who's lived and researched in Germany for, for unfortunately over 40 years, I believe that all too many self-appointed experts misunderestimate these everyday political constraints that derive from four different coalition configurations, the no longer cooperative nature of German federalism and the border transcending power of major economic interest ranging from banks to automobile producers. Add to this the very poisonous impact of various social media outlets that are intent on undermining public faith in the free basic democratic order. In other words, Angela Merkel's day job was a lot harder than it looked. Let me conclude with another first. This chancellor is exiting gracefully and of her own accord, in contrast to all of her male predecessors who were forced out of office by electoral defeats. She is leaving behind a Germany characterized by significantly more tolerance for diversity and for migration, a nation that is not only willing to mobilize much more actively to counter climate change, but a nation that also recognizes it must now assume greater responsibility, even in military terms, for securing peace and human rights around the globe. She is handing over a country in which the pursuit of gender equality is now taken for granted, and in which millions of people have been inspired by the simple phase, the Aschaffendas. As Easterner Jana Hensel has written in Die Zeit, her sentence, we can do this, is the greatest compliment she could have paid us. Quote, she has given us Germans a bit of her greatness and dignity as a charge in exchange. And we will be able to do this now without her. All of this, I argue, stands in stark contrast to the stodgy, rule-obsessed, xenophobic, and often sexist attitudes that I not only personally observed, but also experienced in Germany in the 1970s, the 1980s, and in much of the 1990s. I will deeply miss Angela Merkel, both as a powerful and as a role model, but I suspect so will millions of other people around the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce, for this uh, great insights and thoughts. We move over to Robert. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, uh, both for the kind introduction and the invitation. And I appreciate uh, all the work that the organizers have done to put this together. I, in the end, um, I share Joyce's assessment, even though I come at it from a very different perspective. Uh, what I decided to do when Thomas uh, asked me to talk uh, about one aspect of the legacy of 16 years of Merkel government is to focus on a complaint that uh, many commentators lodge against Merkel's uh, chancellorship. And they talk about the uh, movement of the union towards the democratic center, going to the point where, or reaching the point where the union loses its programmatic profile. And so here's just one headline I found, uh, which uh, somehow phrases this move towards the center as a burden for the union, as something that she did wrong, as something that should have been prevented. And so in the 10 minutes that I have, uh, I'd like to briefly uh, present some evidence as to whether she actually has moved the center towards the, has moved the union towards the programmatic center. 
whether um, the union actually lost some of its uh, core strength that uh, has traditionally been the mainstay of union power. And uh, even if we reach the conclusion that the union has moved towards the ideological center, the question is, was it an unwise, strategically unwise move for the union to go there? Well, just to define the problem, here is a uh, simple chart which positions all parties that competed, all major parties that competed in 2021. This is from the freshly released, uh, released German election study. And it shows on the x-axis uh, a left-right scale where zero means extreme left and 10 means extreme right. You see that the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, is uh, placed by voters in a representative survey at nine. So as a, it is considered a right extreme party. And the union, the CDU in particular, is approaching the center, which is at five, with the FDP and the CSU also being uh, placed very near it. Now, the first question is, has the union moved towards the center under Angela's uh, chancellorship? And as a reference point, the second slide shows the same layout the positioning of parties on the left-right scale, and with the vertical line denoting where the CDU stands in, where well, the CDU is placed in 2021. And there is a clear movement in the perception of voters towards the ideological center. So the FDP is right at the center or near the center where the CDU is now, but the CDU and the CSU are clearly to the right in 2005 where they, from where they are nowadays. So that seems to provide fodder for the argument that the union has moved under her uh, guidance towards the ideological center, which while empirically true, does not mean that she, her policies or she is actually causally responsible for this movement. And in order to illustrate that point, so the first question is um, um, to show how the party has moved over the, over the long run towards the ideological center. Now, this is just a, a illustration of uh, one further point that the RFD now occupies a center at the, at the right, which the union has departed from and thereby through its policies fueled the rise of the RFD in the German party system. In order to adopt a long-term perspective, I went back to the 1980s, the heydays of the union. And it also illustrates two points. One, that the union in, in 1980 was much further to the right where it was in 2005, and certainly where it was in 2021. So the point being that over time, Preceding the Merkel chancellorship, there has been a movement of the union from the, very, from the clear conservative end of the ideological spectrum towards the ideological center. So it partly supports the argument that the union has become more centrist, ideolog as ideologically speaking, but it would be incorrect to conclude that this is primarily attributable to the Merkel chancellorship, given the long-term movement of the uh, center-right parties towards the ideological center. So the, that's the first upshot, really. And the next question then is, given this movement towards the programmatic center, has the union really lost its core strength, which has always been to be viewed as the party of jobs, the party that's good for the economy, the party that's good for all sorts of uh, international uh, security arrangements and so forth. In order to provide some evidence about what happened to the reputation of the union, I went to the venerated polybarometer series, harking back to the late 1970s. And it plots in order to present some evidence that the union has not lost much of its image as the party uh, that is good for the economy. 
So what you see here are uh, the mean scores or the proportion of citizens that it, in every year say that a CDU-led government is best qualified to create new jobs. And it, with the exception of one outlier, which is probably, or which I suspect is a data-related issue, um, the union actually looks quite strong, especially during the time period when Merkel held the reins in Germany. So you see the post-unification dip, which uh, some of us certainly will remember as being a time period when there were intense uh, conflicts uh, over how to fund reunification. Um, it improves, the image of the union improves by 2005 when Merkel becomes the chancellor, and it has roughly uh, stayed at a steady line since then with an uptick as of late in the latest uh, 2020 Politburo meeting. And this, the strength of the union in the economic sector is especially jarring in uh, comparison to the weakness of the social democrats, which will provide the chance, which will elect the chancellor tomorrow. And with Olaf Scholz, Scholz being the incoming chancellor, there we see that the SPD has been at a historic low lately as far as the economy is concerned. You see it in another chart here, which asks a broader question, is the CDU a good party for the economy, for the virtue, generally speaking, not just focusing on jobs. And again, we see that except for the heydays in the second half of the 1980s, under the chancellorship of Angela Merkel, the union has not lost its traditional image of a party that is good for the economy. And again, here's the contrast to the SPD, which is a distinct second place as far as the views of mass publics are concerned. So the second upshot is that uh, even though the union moved towards the ideological center over time, under Merkel and before, it has not lost its traditional its core strength as the party uh, of, of for the, that's best for the economy. So the last question I wanna address, given this movement and given that the union has maintained its strength, actually does it make sense for the union to be in the ideological center? And, and that question in part can only be answered if we also consider where voters stand ideologically and compared to where parties stand ideologically. And so here's a pretty, uh, it's not a complicated chart, it just contains um, a lot of information. Let me briefly outline what I did here. On the x-axis, I plotted the position of say parties on a pro-welfare, pro-market position. I did that on the basis of a expert survey uh, of which Germany was part in 2019. And then on the y-axis, I plotted where uh, parties stand on a cultural liberalism, conservatism uh, scale, also based on the expert survey in 2019. So the blue dots are the positions of political parties in this uh, two-dimensional issue space. You see that the union is uh, adopts a center-right position. The FDP is all the way out to the very right on the economy. And then on the left side, you see that Die Linke, the left party and the Greens adopt economically leftist position and cultural liberal positions. Now the red dots are the voters of these parties. And the one, there are lots of details here, but the one overarching pattern is that most of the voters of all the parties are much more crowded and located near the center. And the key point here is that the, everybody, including the union, has to compete for centrist voters. That is centrist on economic issues. They are not radical leftists on the economy, not radical pro-marketeers. Neither are they radical progressives on the left, right, uh, cultural scale. And so the key point here is that the CDU has, just like all the other parties, has to compete for centrist voters. Somewhat to my surprise, if we do this for East-West, we find roughly the same pattern that in the East, voters are also crowded near the ideological center. 
as they are in the West. So the competitive situation for the union in the East and the West is very similar. There is pressure for all parties to compete for the median voter in the ideological center, regardless of whether we talk about economic and cultural issues. And so that is the third upshot, which leads me to the uh, conclusion that in many ways, the union is in surprisingly good shape, notwithstanding its uh, clear electoral defeat or clear electoral decline over the last several years. And the broad forces that I mentioned at the beginning, much of this, uh, which leads to the movement towards the ideological center, go far beyond Merkel. They, I can only touch upon here, partisan dealignment, the rise of uh, the salience of candidates, the transformation of the economy, et cetera, et cetera, all underlie the long-term movement towards a dealigned electorate. Now, she has reinforced these movements uh, towards the center with some policy. Joyce mentioned the migration policy, uh, but she didn't initiate this movement. She didn't causally just single-handedly move the union towards the center. The second point is the her centrist, policy, her centrist movement and instincts did not hurt the union in the area of core competencies. And there are some specific issues that uh, she used to um, buttress the pro-economic image. I'm just thinking of the severe austerity measures that uh, under her leadership were imposed on Southern European countries. But no matter how we stand and how we evaluate whether it's good, normatively speaking, to be in the center or whether the union should be more towards the right, the matter of the fact is voters are in the ideological center, they are centrist. And from that perspective, the union is really in a good position to become the governing party again, provided it makes the smart decisions in the near future. I have many more thoughts about legacy, but that's it for what I would like to say at this point. And for Q and A, we can talk about some of the other aspects I've listed here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for this fascinating insights into uh, party development in Germany and uh, discussing the question how Merkel made a difference or whether she has made a difference at all. We now turn over the floor to Christian. Uh, Christian, you on? Yeah. Yes. Th thank you very much. Um, Thank you for having me. It's great to be back at NYU. Um, and I will pick up where Robert left off. And I have a very similar chart to, to his. Uh, in part, it's based on uh, the same data. And what I want to do is I want to look forward a, a little, um, thinking about the legacy of Angela Merkel and her years in office. And I want to contrast and compare the party's positions uh, to the positions of the electorate and to what the parties uh, that will form the new federal government starting tomorrow um, wrote into their coalition treaty. So what you see here is it's basically the same as what Robert uh, showed in his uh, last chart. You see a two dimensions of party positioning in, in Germany. We have an economic left-right position and we have a cultural dimension, an, an identity dimension that goes from progressive to conservative. And uh, we have the AFD up here, a very culturally conservative party, far-right party. And we have the CDU here and the SPD there. And uh, you see the lines in the middle, they are in the middle in the sense that they are just, you know, they, they divide um, the dimensions exactly down the, the center. This does not mean necessarily that the, the voters are there, but Robert showed us that the voters are in fact centrist. And I will add some additional data to uh, support support this claim. Now let's, let's look at, um, two, two, 
two aspects in the coalition treaty that we could use to think about uh, these two dimensions, an economic left-right dimension and a cultural dimension. So the first one, um, an economic left-right dimension, um, is about the role of the government in the economy. Um, how much redistribution should there be? And uh, the, uh, let me pull up my pen. The three parties that form the new coalition, uh, they are described by this triangle. So um, there is a, a you know, pretty big distance between the SPD and the FTP on an economic dimension, even though the, on a societal dimension, they are pretty similar. And uh, I found this in the, um, the in the coalition treaty, and I translated it, and it's, uh, the translation is not perfect, but what the parties are saying is that a high level of employment and fair va wages are the foundation of our prosperity and for our social safety net. And I think that just in this one sentence, you see the compromise that has been struck between the parties uh, on the economic left, SPD and Greens, and the FDP. Um, so we, on, on the one hand, we need a high level of employment that implies a pro-market strategy, but we also need fair wages, right? And fair wages, that's connected to, um, to Olaf Scholz's promise of an increase in the minimum wage to 12 euros an hour. Um, why do we need that? It's the foundation of our prosperity, right? So um, market forces, the social market economy serves as uh, the, uh, the guarantee for our prosperity, or it forms the foundation of our prosperity. But it also forms the foundation uh, of our social safety net. So you need to generate uh, through market processes um, the, the, the income and the government revenue that can then be used uh, to fund redistribution. This is not very interesting, to be honest. Right? I mean, this is what you would expect from, from parties that are uh, fairly Far away on an economic dimension, when they have to, they, when they have to, when they have to put their compromise into language that uh, that fits in a coalition tree. The other dimension is way more interesting. We want to shape a fresh start in the policy areas of migration and integration, which does justice to a modern country of immigration, to a modernes Einwanderungsland. So for uh, the, the parties, they unequivocally say that Germany is an immigration country and they want to reform the policies surrounding the area of immigration. Uh, and in that, you see their... Um, that the distance on a on a cultural dimension uh, is much less than what we see on, on an economic dimension. So you know, look looking forward, I think this is where we will see the biggest change in contrast to the old Merkel-led government that was comprised of the CDU and the SPD, where the distance on a cultural dimension was about the same as the distance uh, on, a, uh, on, on an economic dimension. And you know, these are, none of these are exact measurements. They are the attempt at turning qualitative concepts into something that we can put on a chart. Um, but I, I think qualitatively it is correct that the old government was ideologically further apart on a uh, cultural dimension than the new government will be. And that will th make things um, easier on certain policy dimensions, but uh, certainly not on the, on the economic policy dimension. So that's something to, to look out for. Um, another very interesting, fascinating thing that I always find striking in these charts is the positions on the European Union. So we've already heard about uh, Angela Merkel and her legacy as um, bringing forward European unification, dealing with uh, existential crises to the European Union, uh, handling uh, Brexit and the, uh, the sovereign debt crisis. Here is a depiction of 
how important the EU, EU topics are to the parties that we measure, so the salience of uh, European integration in the, party, uh, in the, in the parties' uh, manifestos, uh, but also where they stand on integration. Do they want less integration like the AFD, or do they want more integration like the Green Party? And what you see here is that uh, so the SPD is virtually uh, indistinguishable from the position of the CDU. So this cluster here is CDU SPD that uh, there is uh, hardly any difference between uh, the importance that uh, the, the SPD and the Greens ascribe to the European Union um, the FDP is a bit less more a bit, a bit less importance that uh, they think the European Union has, but uh, all are very pro integrationist parties, pro European Union parties. Um, so you know, and this is reflected in the in the coalition treaty. They are uh, proposing to work for a European Union that is democratically consolidated that is able to act, should be handlungsfähig, and it is strategically sovereign. And that's the foundation, again, for our peace and prosperity. Liberty comes later, by the way. I had to look for it a little bit, but they also talk about liberty. Uh, here in the first sentence of that part of the coalition treaty, it's about peace and prosperity, which I find interesting by and in itself. But there is a high degree of... of um, ideological congruence between the parties that will form the new uh, German federal government. Let me briefly take a look at how this is reflected in the voters' opinion. So here the source is the uh, European Social Survey, just the, the part that uh, relates to Germany. Um, and you know, this is when people are asked, do you think that governments should reduce differences in income levels? And you know, this is a striking number. That's uh, more than 70% in Germany say, I strongly agree or I agree. This is high also in uh, by international comparison, even within Europe. So these numbers are very pro-redistributionist. However, you know, if, you, if you ask a slightly differently worded question about redistribution, that is large differences in income are acceptable to reward talents and efforts. Um, you have a majority that either agrees or strongly agrees, and only six percent strongly disagrees. So this would be, you know, this would be something that the FDP could get behind the pro-business liberals. Um, that uh, differences in income levels uh, they should be allowed or they're acceptable because they reflect uh, different talents and and efforts. Um, on a cultural dimension. Uh, this you know, underlines what Robert said about the German uh, voting population being smack in the middle of uh, the ideological distribution. This is the question, do immigrants make a country, your country worse or a better place to live? Here on the left is worse. Um, so the mean is slightly in favor of make a better place to live, but the vast majority, so you know, the plur not the majority, but the plurality of respondents, about 30% are smack in the middle of, of this question. This simply means, oh, you know, we, we're not radical in any sense. We don't want to open up the country to everyone, but we also don't want restrictive policies. Immigration has, has something going for it. As such, you know, this, this centrist um, general configuration of the German policy space has not changed and it will not change under the new government where I expect to see ch some changes are in the area of uh, immigration policies uh, but uh, we don't expect radical a radical departure from what uh, Merkel's at least two last governments did up until now. I'll leave it at that. Uh, if my 10 minutes are up, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Christian, for this perfect uh, kind of following up on Robert's uh, points. I think this gave, gave us great, great insights in the current um, electoral markets in, in Germany. I now turn over uh, to Stephen uh, to um, invite a next round of panel discussion. 
All right. Thank you so much. This is really, really fascinating. And I, I, I loved all three of the presentations. I thought they fit well together. So I think maybe it makes sense for me to pose a couple of maybe two or three questions to all the panelists and then to turn it over to you to have a kind of a, a conversation together. And then maybe we can, uh, Tomas can take another round of comments and we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, and I wanted to start out with uh, a point made by, by Joyce about the sheer number of crises uh, that Anglo America had to face. Um, and you went through the litany of these from the finance or the Euro crisis to migration in Ukraine and now COVID. And, and I'm just curious about all of your opinions about how you feel this shaped the ability to form a long-term domestic policy. Did, did, did this derail plans that she had uh, coming into office in 2005? And, and, and should, should she be known more as kind of a Christ, uh, chancellor that, that successfully navigated these crises, um, but then uh, uh, domestic kind of long-term policy faced challenges as a result. So I'm curious how, how, how you would reflect on, on you know, her navigation of these challenges and how it affected um, uh, domestic policy. The second kind of related question is the issue of governing with the SPD uh, for such a large chunk of time and how that affected CDU policy. And, you, and, and you know, we, we, we saw some very interesting examples about how, uh, you know, voters are clustering in the middle um, and about how the, the, <clears throat> uh, the parties are kind of pulling to the outside, at least on Robert's charts. Um, uh, uh, and I'm curious how, how then, then governing with the SPD, you know, in concrete terms, how did it affect CDU policy? Are there concrete instances where uh, the two were, were facing challenges and wanted to move in a different direction, but we're thinking about this, this common centrist voter, or if you have any particular anecdotes about the challenges of governing with the party uh, that was the opposition, but now you're in coalition. And then kind of a derivative of this to, to follow up on Robert's kind of uh, points to discuss in, in uh, you know, in the follow-up is, is did this kind of move quasi moved to the center and governing with, with, with the SPD open up room for the AFD to thrive. This is a common explanation that one hears and I'd you know, be very, very interested to hear your opinion on this or if you have kind of another uh, way, way to make sense of the rise of the AFD. And then the last point um, or question would be about climate change in particular. Th this is something that seems to be hotly debated right now in terms of Angela Merkel's legacy. You know, She's been known as, as the climate chancellor. She's done a lot to put climate change on the international uh, uh, agenda you know, being environmental minister in the 1990s, you know, she was very early, you know, in the mark in doing this. And yet others criticize her for being a climate chancellor off duty. And there, you know, are examples of her kind of watering down um, <clears throat> efforts to impose CO2 limits on cars, for example, or maybe not pushing the coal phase out as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts as well on, on how do we assess this aspect of her legacy where climate change is a crisis that really has, you know, in, in some ways just grown steadily and then really accelerated as a public, uh, as, as, a, as a problem of public interest um, and, and what to make of Miracle's legacy in that uh, respect. Um, so I invite you all to, to comment on any of those or to comment on anything else that uh, your fellow panelists um, um, talked about. And perhaps we'll, we'll start with Joyce uh, and, and then move, move through the lineup again through Robert uh, and then Christian. And then uh, Thomas, feel free to chime in as well if you want. Well, I have some thoughts on the first question regarding Merkel as the crisis chancellor, as well as on the last one regarding climate change. I think we have to keep in mind that Angela Merkel grew up in East Germany. And if there's one thing she wasn't, it was ideological. She had had enough of isms and therefore she even had trouble admitting that she was a feminist, although many of the policies that she had adopted through Fund der Leyen were very much in a gender equality dimension. So that means when she came in, she did not have a grand vision. She had been through that for 35 years. And that's why we really need to emphasize the kind of non-ideological, pragmatic respond, think my way through the problems as a physicist kind of approach she took to leadership in general. And she just happened to be at the right place at the right time in terms of all these crises as a person who could remain calm, who could think her way through problems, who could take a non-ideological approach, 
that I think that that allowed her to start sort of cobbling together certain issues that she took ultimately a much more holistic approach. It's true that Germany had already begun to change slightly in terms of its orientation towards migration. The coal era policies towards asylum seekers were draconian. I have spent days in the Ausländer Behörde. I can tell you how hellish it was just trying to get my own Aufenthaltsberechtigung or a visa for my son when he had an internship. But Merkel also came into office at a point that where German industries had recognized they were facing a major demographic crisis. And if they didn't find some new source of skilled workers, they'd run into the wall. She coincided, her beginning period in office coincided with generational change. A whole generation of kids who grew up under the Erasmus program, traveling a lot themselves. So she was very good, I think, at just taking parts of these various crises and trying to forge them into a more holistic approach. And you see that also in some of von der Leyen's approaches now at the EU level. Let me just shift then a little bit to the climate change orientation. Like the migration policies, where a lot of laws regarding asylum were changed between 2008 and 2014, even in terms of the citizenship law, Optionsflicht disappeared. The climate change acceleration that took place legally, legislatively, right after Fukushima was immense, 12 new laws. But she needs the lender to implement them. And she also needs the international community. And then she's hit with the likes of Trump leaving the Paris Accords and Obama not really pushing the issue at home, not being able to get India and China on board. So she has to operate between levels. Germany did upload higher environmental standards to the EU. And so I tend to look at the big picture rather than the forest, rather than the trees. And I'll leave the trees up to my colleagues then. Robert, go, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, lots of interesting points. Thank you for, for that, Stephen. Uh, I just wanna make two here and I couldn't help myself and pull up yet another chart if that's okay with you and the audience. And it concerns the question that you and both uh, raised, uh, did the policy contribute to the rise of the AfD, uh, especially in the East, but also in the West, the movement towards the center, did it open up the flank? Uh, and, and I was actually surprised when I started to look at the data that most of the voters are in the center, so especially also in the East. So why then did the AfD emerge if the CDU and the mainstream parties cover the preference territory that most voters carry around in their heads? And it uh, reminded me that policy preferences aren't the only relevant dimension when people um, attempt the ballot box. There are lots of uh, emotional sentiments that float around. There are foundational questions about what's the right political system. And of course, this line of thinking then immediately harks back to German unification. And uh, many of us have spent many years, perhaps too many years, studying uh, German unification. And I immediately thought of the fundamental dissatisfaction that may still exist in some parts of Germany, especially in East Germany. And so the one figure that I could find with a sufficient longitudinal um, coverage is a question, the standard question we use in surveys about satisfaction with the existing democracy in Germany. And again, on the y-axis, high values mean people are satisfied and uh, lower values mean people tend to be more dissatisfied. The blue squares are the eastern states and the red dots are the western states. And there's a parallel movement. That's the first thing that uh, jumps to mind. But second of all, there's always a gap. And the eastern states tend to be more dissatisfied. The western states tend to be more satisfied. Now, there's a crisis of democracy, supposedly, according to some pundits, not just in the east, but also the west. But one might, may argue if we, uh, that this lower level of satisfaction with the existing system is actually a potential for the AFD to tap into. This is a poor measure, it's a proxy. Um, I wish there were better measures available over time. And, but this is the best we have in terms of data coverage to illustrate that there's a foundational dissatisfaction with the political system in the East, notwithstanding the relatively um, 
similar perceptions of how well people are doing in their own lives. That's one of the remarkable findings of public opinion research. People in the East and the West are fairly satisfied with their own economic situation, but they complain about something, they find criticism to, about more foundational questions as to how the political systems work, how the economic system work, works. And so I think it go, the rise of the RFD, especially in the East, goes beyond policy preferences, it concerns systemic issues. That's the first issue. And the second one is just from a very different uh, perspective. Uh, a secondary theme in German politics, and we all look to the election of the new chancellor tomorrow, but a secondary theme is the candidate competition for the union leadership um, that will take place uh, in, probably early next year. And there we see two wings competing, one cons very conservative, not very, but rather conservative wing, with uh, Friedrich Merz being in the pole position there. And then there is Röttgen and Braun, who represent more the traditional centrist, middle of the road policy uh, spectrum. And how the union will fare and how policies will play out really depends on who wins this election. If the um, coalition, as Christian nicely developed, is will be divided over several issues, not all, but several issues, then a clear alternative on the center right, as exemplified by the then leader of the CDU, will have a chance to increase the salience of the traditional core strength of the union. If they go for a centrist leader, it may be more appropriate for voters, but will it be enough to actually clarify the image of the CDU in the minds of voters? That's a key question, and it will in part be decided by who will make it, who will win the intra-party competition. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Robert. Would you mind unsharing your screen? And then uh, Christian? Thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Stephen. Um, uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about climate change first. And I also have an additional chart. Um, let me pull it up. So this is um, the question, what was the most important topic during the electoral campaign and for your, your vote choice? And um, there are three almost um, equally large camps uh, among the respondents. Uh, this is um, the social safety net redistribution. This is climate and the environment. And this is the economy and, and labor. And you see 28% think that uh, the first topic was the most important one, 22 and 22% respectively think that the second and the, the third one was the most important one. So uh, climate was a major issue in this electoral campaign. Um, and the, C the, the, the SPD, the, I'm sorry, the, the CDU, um, could not capitalize on any of these issues for different reasons. It couldn't capitalize on the climate issue because this issue was clearly owned by the Greens, right? So, and you, you don't compete against a party that can credibly claim issue ownership. Um, that's that's a, a failing a failing strategy. Um, and everything else was um, the, 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 the SPD was slightly ahead, right? And this also has to do with uh, the candidates uh, for, for the chancellery. Um, Armin Laschet was simply not in a position to claim this uh, competence that uh, Robert outlined in his, in his data. Uh, he could not get it across that the CDU is the more able party to address those people who, you know, the 28% or the 22% who think that the economy and labor are the most important issue. That slack was taken up in part by the SPD and uh, the other part uh, went to the FDP. But it's interesting to see this three equally divided camps, I think that is 
almost equally divided camps. I think that is something new that we have not seen in previous elections. And um, I don't know if it's an, a legacy of the Merkel years or if it signifies a more fundamental change among the, uh, the German electorate, um, but it is there and it is reflected in the in the loss of the of the CDU. I mean, the CDU, you know, the CDU's fall from power is not unusual in a European context. The uh, support that they got just puts them where other center right parties are elsewhere in Europe. Uh, they were uh, the, the 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 SPD preceded them in that development on the center left. Uh, but it's it's not unusual that big parties become small in Europe. Um, so the CDU takes part in a in a process that has structural reasons and has been going on for a long time. Actually, they are relatively late in feeling um, the, the the consequences of these structural transformations. And one of those reasons that they are relatively feeling it have been feeling it relatively late uh, is Angela Merkel. Right. She was able uh, to um, get the support behind the CDU at a time when, for structural reasons, it was actually no longer there, as, uh, you know, as um, shown by uh, election results in other European countries. Um, I want, to, I want to add one more thing about the rise of the AFD. Um, I don't think that it has anything to do with the CDU moving to the left because the CDU hasn't really moved to the left during the years uh, when the AFD um, rose to, to prominence. So it's simply no there, there. Uh, what has happened though is what I call a depoliticization of politics. It has to do with Angela Merkel's style of governing, but it also has to do with the fact that, and here we come back to the crisis, that some of those crises did not leave any other way out, at least not in the perception of the time. Uh, Angela Merkel herself invoked the there is no alternative rhetoric. It, uh, and if the euro fails, uh, Europe will fail, and this will not happen. So there is no alternative to keeping Greece in uh, the Eurozone. Uh, this was echoed by Draghi, whatever it takes, we will, we will do. And it's no coincidence that the most popular far-right party in Germany calls itself the alternative for Germany. In my opinion, that's a reaction to uh, the rhetoric of there is no alternative and uh, an attempt at repoliticizing uh, the, the discourse. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? It doesn't make the thing automatically more democratic, but it makes it more polarized. And um, the AFD was able to capitalize on the deep polarization of the political discourse. Yes, yeah. I could, uh, I'd like to return to the point about the CDU leadership struggle that uh, Wolbert raised. Uh, I talked to a colleague yesterday in Tübingen who pointed out to me that Olaf Scholz was uh, had done his best to Merkel his way through the campaign. The fact that she served or he served with Angela Merkel for the last four years made him also the symbol of kind of continuity. And while Baerbock was falling on her sword and Laschet was busy falling into the, the mud somewhere, uh, he was able to maintain this sort of calm, just don't make any mistakes demeanor. So in that sense, people are getting a degree of continuity. But on the AFD point, I want to remind you all that the AFD was created by a West German economics professor. It had to do with the Euro and it simply provided a vessel for Easterners then to begin articulating a lot of their discontent, which I think has to do with the way in which unification was conducted the revelation that less than 2% of all German elites are Easterners at this point. I think a lot of those old resentments just found a new vessel for their uh, collection and, and articulation. But I just had to remind everybody, AFD was a Western creation. Sorry, guys. No, no that's, that's a very important point. Um, 
to Tomas, I, I saw your your hand up. Do you want to jump in and ask some questions? And then uh, I, we also have seven in the Q&A that, that we can turn to after maybe you pose your own. Okay. Yeah, I, I love to. I just want to come back to two points that I think are interesting with regard to the broader implications for German politics. I think nobody would, would doubt um, the observation that Angela Merkel is an extremely modern person for her party and for Germany. Why is that? She's a Protestant, she doesn't have children, and she's a working woman who kept her own name. That's a no-go for a CDU politician in the 1970s and 80s. So she symbolizes um, on the basis of her biographical achievements how much the party has changed and maybe Germany has changed too. But the big question for me is, is she a cause or an effect? Um, and I think here several positions were being taken in the panel and maybe we could come back to this question. Um, if I kind of try to find policy decisions where Angela Merkel really moved modernization uh, in Germany, I draw blank, I don't find much. Uh, the big policy decision, for example, that um, modernized German migration policy was in the Schröder government, the change in the citizenship law. So what uh, Gerhard Schröder and Joschka Fischer did for uh, modernizing Germany in terms of citizenship and migration was monumental, I think. Um, Schröder and Fischer uh, phased out nuclear energy, was, which was reversed by a later Merkel government. Um, and Angela Merkel did nothing for gender equality in terms of policy making. She even was against the quota question. So I tried to be provocative um, and would invite maybe some further thoughts on this. For me, Angela Merkel was an effect, not a cause when it comes to modernizing Germany. The second uh, point that I wish to make is also try, tries to kind of break up a bit the kind of general agreement that we have. Uh, one of the puzzling questions with regard to Angela Merkel is for me that she is with no doubt an extremely esteemed leader at the national and international level. In all German elections, she was able to score a candidate effect being much more popular than her own party. And at the EU level, the last um, um, meeting of the council was a love feast for Angela Merkel, culminating in the claim that uh, the council meetings in the future without Angela Merkel will equal Paris without the Eiffel Tower. Uh, so she is an extremely esteemed leader. But the big puzzle for me with regard to Angela Merkel is that she is an esteemed leader without much results. She uh, ruined her party electorally. Um, the EU is in a state of crisis, not only with regard to Brexit, but also with regard to severe policy disagreements. Um, and also with regard to uh, um, boiling kind of constitutional question, what actually the EU treaties mean for national level government. And with regard to policy making, the current coalition negotiations were based on the assumption we need to turn every stone uh, around and we need to severely um, innovate in terms of policy making and modernize Germany. So, um, and this brings us to a point that Joyce actually made. Maybe it's not the fault of Angela Merkel. Maybe it has to do with the question, can the German government govern at all? So maybe there are so many constraints in contemporary politics in Germany and also in Europe that it's actually impossible for an individual person to govern, even for such an able politician that Angela Merkel was. And nobody would basically doubt this point. So maybe we could also come back to this question, can the German government govern? And uh, can we expect anything of the future uh, government? Do we want to go reverse order this time just to mix it up? Christian? Sure, I can try. Um, can the German government govern? Um, I think they can govern, 
but it's not a style of government that we would associate with um, leadership personalities like, let's say, Helmut Schmidt in German history. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more a um, trying to to seek a policy compromise in an extremely complicated, uh, tangled web of uh, mutual interdependence. Mm -hmm. You have the states, uh, Joyce alluded to that. You have the coalition partners. You have uh, the public opinion that you have to deal with. And you have elections um, that happen frequently at different levels. So there is no style of policymaking that says basta, uh, as Gerhard Schröder attended. Um, we doing this or that, but there is the necessity to form coalitions, um, formal and informal, to see your projects through to the extent possible. And it will be interesting to see whether the new coalition with their clear look to modernize the country, to leave no stern, uh, stone unturned, whether they will be able to actually follow through in an environment that may be more conducive to doing so because it's no longer a grand coalition. And it's a coalition that is that seems to actually want to govern, unlike the 2017 to 2021 coalition where you frequently had the impression nobody's really wanted the job anymore. Right? I mean, it took them forever to even form the government. It was the longest coalition negotiation uh, in the history of the Federal Republic. Now that seems to have changed. There is, uh, I mean, here in Germany, uh, there is a sense of a new beginning in, in the air. Not exactly a new morning in America or Germany, but something, you know, uh, adjusted for for German phlegma uh, that seems to point in this direction. Mm -hmm. And you know, starting tomorrow, we'll see how, how, how they will be able to do it. It will be very interesting to observe that from political science perspective, whether it actually makes a difference who is in charge. Mm -hmm. May, may I just add something? I think, Christian, what you showed was fascinating, the kind of, with regard to the coalition situation, the kind of closeness in terms of cultural issues, migration, um, gender equality, um, minorities, and things like that, and uh, the distance in terms of economic issues. And I think this kind of uh, gives us an idea about future policy making in the next three to four years. I agree with you that this government wants to govern, but I, I don't think that it's too far-fetched to argue that probably the biggest result, we will see the biggest result in cultural, in, in the era of cultural issues, and that the bad news for Germany is actually that the badly needed economic reform still will have to wait because of coalition problems. Robert, would you uh, have anything to add? Yeah, I have two re uh, reactions to Thomas's uh, exciting and excitable comments. Um, first of all, I thought when you spoke, Thomas, and I thought about what does legacy really mean in terms of leadership legacy? We all recognize that Angela Merkel is a single individual who cannot unilaterally uh, and single-handedly control all possible causes of, of everybody who has uh, an influence on national affairs, international affairs. So I think there are two, at least two distinctions we need to make here. One is uh, what can we uh, unequivocally attribute to Merkel policies and her own individual preferences and actions? That's, that's the first question. That's really extremely hard for us as social scientists to sort out because we don't have access to the kind of research design that we all treasure in order to establish a causality in some, uh, with some degree of confidence. Mm -hmm. But second of all, we don't need to do that because I think legacy in the context of leadership assessments also means symbolic le legacy. Leaders mm -hmm. get, uh, get uh, attributed with all sorts of uh, powers. They have to endure justified and unjustifiable um, responsi 
or they have to take responsibility for all sorts of things that they really had no influence over. And I think that's just fair. That's how democratic systems work. They do work by leaders accepting the responsibility that for things that happen under their reign, regardless of whether they individual, individually controlled the causes and uh, the outcomes uh, of presumed causes. So I think it's only fair to attribute to Angela Merkel and many of the things that uh, both Joyce mentioned in terms of the positives, but also the negatives that you mentioned. Uh, um, and I think in terms of, uh, so for example, I was thinking about the Brexit, that's just one of the major black markers on her uh, legacy. Uh, we will all ask questions about it. Did she do everything that she could have done to offer Cameron what he needed to come home and avoid uh, a referendum? Did she do enough during the negotiations when the EU uh, pushed for a hard line to get through through the chaos uh, in London? Uh, did she do enough or did she do enough at the very end to uh, get uh, the, uh, uh, the Irish on board in order to uh, uh, solve the Nor Northern Irish versus the British mainland conflicts? Now, these are questions to which I don't have answers to. I don't think Lots of people have certain answers to, but in terms of the legacy building, these are the potential gray, these are gray marks on her, uh, on the negative side of the ledger that we as uh, political scientists and that historians will have to answer for uh, presumably many years to come. Joyce. I, well, I will reinforce uh, the points my colleagues have made. Uh, Helmut Schmidt never heard of multi-level governance. We should not forget that the introduction of the euro also meant an intensification and acceleration in many areas of European integration. That the European Parliament has also polarized, politicized many of these issues because since Amsterdam, the, the parliament has co-decision in 85 different fields. Merkel is not acting independently in the dealings over Brexit. She's dealing with Poland. She's got the council members themselves have become a lot more divided with the introduction of the, uh, fifth, well, 12 East European, Central East European countries. So she has to play a multi-level game. And I think I agree with Christian that this is going to be the new style of governance for everybody. This is not something that can be attributed to a single person. And of course, I have to pick up the gauntlet of gender equality in, for Thomas' sake. Um, remember, Merkel was her divorce name. Uh, her real name was Kostner. But she also grew up in East Germany, where women's paid employment was taken for granted, where subsidized child care was taken for granted, where extended, extended maternity leaves paid the right to abortion, all kinds of other things were taken for granted. And it really did take teamwork between Merkel and von der Leyen and Siobhan, among others, to kind of make these policies a little bit more palatable. I mean, there have been many instances where it took a mother of seven children to point out that women with children can still engage in paid labor. And there I would see many occasions where von der Leyen would go out with a more radical proposition, kind of hammer on the table for a while. Merkel would roll her back in and then they wound up in Germany, not with a 40% quota, but with a 30% quota, allowing Merkel to go to the hardliners and say, oh, guys, the devil EU made me do it. Or alternatively, she could say, oh, if I hadn't kept von der Leyen under control, things could have been a lot worse. So this was a gradual process, but the policy changes in the gender area are profound. The share of men who take advantage of, of parental leave rose from 3% in 2009 to 36% already by 2015. 36 months of leave spread out over eight years and men are taking a much more active part there. Even the percentage of West German women who used to be qualified as Rabenmutter, the you know raven mothers, has risen to almost 70%. And there has been the first baby boom in Germany since the 1960s, 
And Christian has also contributed to that. So thank you very much for saving the Germans from themselves, so to speak. All right. If, if, so th this is a fantastic discussion. I, I, I see that there are some answers or Q questions in the Q&A from the audience. And I do want to get to those before uh, we, we have our time come to an end. Um, and so I'm going to read through some of these. I think a few may have been covered already, um, but, but but some have not. Uh, the first one asks how Angela Merkel's years in office will inform the composition of the current cabinet. Are there any reactions or continuities that we need to pay attention to, I think? Um, uh, the, the, the second, I, I think, comes from a point that, that, that Joyce made earlier about what do the panelists make of the continued general lack of East German representation in higher office in Germany? Um, how to explain it? What, what are the ramifications, I suppose? Um, uh, very specific question, then, what kind of a new focus are you expecting from the Kulturstadtministerium uh, for the Green Party, uh, Claudia Roth? Um, and then a question specifically uh, for Joyce about now that uh, Merkel is no longer chancellor, who or what will be the focus of your new research? Um, um, uh, let me see. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of them, but I think you you all can can look at them in the Q and A, you know, as well. Um, in uh, the post Merkel times, do you think there's space for another influential and long term leader to arise in Germany? And if yes, who will they be and what qualities will they need to possess? Uh, so asking you to take out your crystal balls, so to speak. Um, and then the last is circling back to the AFD. Uh, and if the if the success of the AFD and its rise is more about strat mobilization strategy and media presence than it is about ideology. Um, and a corollary about the left's harsh losses and if that's related to, to a similar kind of lack of immediate policy. Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, I think if you have any particular takes, feel free to, to, to ask them and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do one more round through and then I'll, I'll make uh, some brief concluding remarks and then, and then I think our time will come to, to a close. Um, uh, Joyce, do, do you have any thoughts about your, your, new, your next project? Oh, yeah. The research question is easy. I spent the entire pandemic writing a book on the dialectical identities of Eastern Germans, where I researched a lot of this resentment. Uh, but my next book will be on Ursula von der Leyen. I had started one on her as the first female defense minister. And then I decided, well, since she has just taken on a new job, I'll wait a few years till I have a paper trail there and can work on, on that subject. So that's the easy one to answer. But uh, it also segues nicely into the question about the current cabinet. Uh, there is now a female defense minister, the third one in a row. There is the first female foreign minister, and there is also the first female interior minister in the post-war history of Germany. And Annalena Baerbock, having run as the chancellor candidate, I think that all of these are at least the indirect effect of Merkel's having opened up many more positions to women, especially in the executive branch. People all talk about quotas in the legislature, but we underestimate how many women she had, 50% of all the department heads in the Bundeskanzleramt, things along those lines. So I think there's definitely a tendency to say, well, at least she started this, so let's sort of carry it on from here. But there are only two East Germans in the current cabinet, in the new cabinet, as there were two East Germans in the last one until Giffey was forced to resign. Robert? Yeah, I just pick, uh, cherry pick a couple of questions here. One is uh, uh, the last one on the popularity of the AFD. That's an interesting one because it focuses on uh, Presumably, social media uh, usage. I, I would, I suspect that the right-wing parties, like uh, elsewhere in, in Western Europe, are actually quite good at using social media to mobilize uh, uh, followers, and they may not uh, rely as much on uh, on the traditional canvassing methods of the traditional way of uh, getting voters to the ballot box. So I, I'm not aware of any systematic study that uh, has specifically looked at it, but that's clearly. Uh, 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 an interesting hypothesis to uh, look at that in addition to the resentment that they mobilized supposedly in order to um, be successful at the ballot box. box. Why did the left party see such hard, harsh, harsh losses? That's interesting uh, to, to juxtapose the two extremes. 
the extreme left and the extreme right. I think the, the left got a bit squeezed. Uh, if you recall the two two-dimensional issue spaces, there uh, is the FDP, uh, SPD and the Greens, uh, plus combined with the uh, with, with a leadership which has performed subpar during the election campaign. So there we see the reverse of the Mer Merkel effect, at least as part of the story. So that's one question. The other specific one I can answer quickly, where are the CSU voters in my graph? Well, I, I simply didn't include them because it's only Bavaria and the N is simply too small, the number of cases, the number of respondents for one survey. So that's why I omitted them in that particular graph. Thanks. Kristen, go ahead. Yeah, I gotta, uh, answer, try and answer the, the last question. So um, first of all, I don't think that the AFD was particularly successful. They lost votes, they lost seats, and they're no longer uh, shares, and they, they're no longer the largest opposition party. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the only issue that they are seen as halfway competent uh, was not on many people's minds, which is migration. Right. They were not able to uh, come up with a coherent uh, policy position um, when it came to Corona. In fact, there was um, there was great party disunity when it came to that. They're only starting now to uh, squarely fall into uh, the camp of anti-Corona protesters. So, but that had not happened by the uh, by the time the election was held. And for everything else, the important issues um, that that I showed that people said were the important issues. I didn't have any answers. So now they are at, uh, what, 12%. Uh, and that's not unusual in a Western European context for a far-right populist party. And I think the, uh, the, the country can, can live with, with that, um, even though you know, there are parts of the country where they're obviously much, much stronger, which is, which is a problem. The left is an interesting, an interesting case. Um, my take on it is that they were so weak because they almost made it into government, and that made many people think twice. You know, there was uh, there was a certain point during the campaign when a red, red, green coalition seemed to be a viable uh, option. And I think that many people shied away from that and turned to uh, the, the free Democrats, um, at, uh, maybe to the, to, not, not to the CDU, to, to the free Democrats in order to, to avoid such um, a possibility of a far left coalition. Um, and it reinforces Robert's point that the German electorate is really uh, centric through and through. There is no room for, uh, there's no taste for any kind of uh, two uh, experiments that would be considered too far-fetched. Um, East German representation in, in the cabinet, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing um, challenge, uh, problem that uh, obviously cannot uh, leave, um, you know, it's something that has to be addressed in my, in my opinion, um, because it's a, a practice that's very strong in German politics to see that different, uh, it was mentioned during the discussion, different wings of the party are represented, different regions are represented in the party leadership and um, when it comes to uh, executive positions. And this continuously is not happening to people from East Germany. Um, but I don't have a good idea what to do about it. Um, maybe it just takes some, some time. Um, let me look at the questions if I have to say anything else. I have no idea what Claudia Roth is going to do as the Kulturstaatsministerin. Uh, I mean, you know, she's a, a mainstay of German politics. Um, she started out as the tour manager and uh, organizer for Tonstein Scherben, a, a far left band in Germany of the 1970s. Uh, and, um, but I don't know if she will bring that expertise to her, to her new job. And uh, you know, I, I don't think it will have an impact on the way uh, culture will be promoted in, in Germany. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I know everybody can't see 
everybody else in the audience, but I want to thank our, our, our panelists. This is a fascinating conversation. I really learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, Tomas, uh, for, for being here and for organizing and for participating and reflecting on uh, 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 Angela Merkel, you know, in many ways, I'll, I'll, I'll just say a couple quick remarks um, that I think, you know, in many ways that, that she will be missed, even for an American like myself in 2016, after um, after Trump was elected, it was in a sense, a little bit of a relief to look across the Atlantic and see somebody who uh, had a certain amount of continuity and aplomb and, and, and uh, you know, and stability. So, uh, but on the other hand, I think that, that there is a sense of a new era potentially. Uh, and uh, one of the fascinating things, I think, is this question of, of, of modernization that clearly, as Joyce pointed out, Germany has modernized a lot in the last two decades. And yet one of the main things that the new coalition agreement focuses on is, is the need to modernize further. I think that's above all the state. That, 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 that's one of the first uh, things that they go into in detail in their new coalition agreement. So this is, you know, an open question. And as is the, the question, I think that the devil's not just German politicians, but politicians everywhere is governing, uh, governing the challenge of governing a modern complex government uh, you know, government, especially in Europe, where there's so many layers of, of you know, of governance and how uh, things can, how policies can can, can proceed, and um, how much we should attribute to the will or the influence of any one individual. I think that this may be more challenging in Europe. Uh, on the one hand, when we think that there's an added, very complex European layer of governance, but then here again, from America, you know, what one looks at American politics and sees equal equally challenging uh, uh, obstacles for pushing through any type of progressive or groundbreaking legislation. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of perspective to be gained from, from thinking about this, uh, the legacy of Merkel's uh, 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 rule over Germany. Uh, and again, thank you uh, to everyone for, for joining us and thank you to all the participants. Um, and stay tuned for next uh, spring's schedule. I'm not sure what exactly we have lined up, but I know that French elections are on the horizon, so we may turn uh, turn westwards and, you know, have a discussion about that. But um, hope everybody's end of the semester wraps up well. Uh, and thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.